Welcome to the ninth episode in Speaking of Poetry. I'm Rennie McQuilkin, publisher of Antrim House Books, whose authors are featured in this series. I am delighted to be joined today by Marilyn Johnston. Twenty years ago, Marilyn took a courageous leap of faith. She retired from her work in the world of insurance at Cigna to work and play in the world of poetry. And once Marilyn has decided to do something, there is no holding her back. <laughs> in a relatively short period of time, she has produced two books, Silk Fist Songs and Weight of the Angel, as well as a chapbook, Against Disappearance, which was published as a finalist for the Red Green Press Poetry Prize. In addition, she has, for several years, co-hosted and produced a fine poetry series at the Wintonbury Branch Library in Bloomfield. That series presents featured and open mic poets once a month from October through April. Marilyn Johnston's poems are subversive. Gray Jacobic has said that we should travel them at our own risk since they may deepen our hearts. Are you ready to take that risk? If so, please join me in enjoying the poetry of Marilyn Johnston. Thank you, Rennie, for that wonderful introduction. I'm very, very pleased to be here today to be sharing my poems with you this afternoon. Um, it's a privilege uh, to be part of this program that is a unique outreach for, for poetry audiences now. Um, I've decided to take you on a little journey through various time periods, different passages of my life, some um, happy times, some uh, marked by loss and grief, as, <clears throat> as Rennie was indicating. Um, so I thought I would just kick off with a, actually it's a poet, a poem that's a favorite of Rennie's, and it's called Mark Making the News. It's one that Rennie recalls as shooting hoops. Uh, it, probably it sticks in his mind because I have that many poems dealing with uh, sports. It's my first and last one almost. But it, I loved his term for it, shooting hoops. It, it really strikes the idea I want of trying to do something difficult, trying to uh, get the ball in the hoop, trying to <clears throat> do that against obstacles, against gravity, almost against the weakness that you might be dealing with uh, in your own arms, but to, to make the effort. And so this poem is one that came out of an afternoon of watching the Yukon women play basketball, and I was sharing that game with my mother and watching her excitement too. And um, this is the period I was in midlife, and we were watching these, these expert young women as they played their game. So the title of the poem is Making the News. Come on, mother yells at our girls on the TV woman's basketball team of my alma mater, for which she displayed little to mild in interest when I was a student struggling to win my own games for her. Leaving her condo today, I pull into our town monastery parking lot near the rusted hoop with its net of shards. Reach in the trunk, lift out the tensed ball, run the length of the cracked asphalt court alone, dribbling at a heavy jog. Over and over, I bounce, set, heave the ball high, miss by a yard, focus wrong. Thick scrub of forsythia deftly snag and roll the ball back to me. My breath comes in easy bursts. The hills thin to their transparent blue. Then, there, all along, in the adjacent field, dozens of clumsy, slow-strolling Canada geese spread out in the low mist, 
stand at their feet in reaped rows. Vainly I bend, bounce, run again, aim the ball and miss. Then a last shot goes in. No one watches. One goose stumbling up a furrow crest, back turned, rises on its toes and claps its wings. The ending of that poem has a little bit of undercutting of irony, um, maybe belittling our, our, our hard-won achievements, but uh, I think the emphasis was on the heroic effort and the heroic attempt of these endeavors. Um, I'm going back to childhood in this next one, and this is, uh, you can picture a daughter, young child, leaning up against the mother as she's very absorbed in, in her craft, and um, the name of the poem is Crocheting. Eyelet to eyelet, the will to pattern, the will for binding, Working a slender needle, light as a slim pencil, delicately poking the invisible hook in, out, in, out, the firm white hands rocking, cranking, loop after loop, making a chain catch up with itself, interlocking, building the sudden thread coin, turned on the tip ends of fingers on which to catch more loops, more spirals, lacing out right under the eyes to a full-sized dresser scarf or circular doily to add to all the others placed over surfaces. One day every summer, she'd gather all the doilies in the house, hand wash, then bleach them to brilliant snow lay them damp on newspapers, breathing in their perfect ruffles, she'd re-knuckle, petal by petal, standing them back up in their light starch to dry in the rush of breezes pouring through open windows, all the stiffening doilies. In the fall, back down in Dad's chairs, Hands again in that silent whir, head down, needle rocking. Dad might be out. He might return looped up, as they both called it. But she would be there, waiting to be circled back to. The worm in her brow, the hook, moving faster and faster on some days, other days, slowed, dreamy, distracted. Her doilies are piled up years in my closet, yellowed, crumpled, scalloped edges, eyelet to eyelet. I remember that green chair and her trying to catch hold in all the catching and holding, the longing of delicate loops containing air. And I do write quite a bit about my family and from the perspective of a child. Uh, and uh, this is a snapshot of my father and, um, and me in a moment. And it's called Home Cure. Home Cure. With smoke squint eye and ruck, ruck, work roughened fingers, he bows over me in pure attention, tending, carefully tying the short white thread around the wart sprouted on the base of my elbow, cutting below the knot, then deftly charring two loose ends with a match flame. Wear it three days, he intones. I wear it three months, to and from school, like a secret badge, marking me cured, long after the dirt gray thread ravels and the wart stays. How he ministered to me with his hopes, 
and desperately our king promises chicken noodle soup for flu, vitreous castor oil for constipation, scarlet splash of mercurochrome for lesions, poison ivy, paste of yellow glycerol soap, misery of any kind or degree, his warm hand covering half my face, but nothing Nothing for the child's long ache, watching him fade each week to a cornered slump, numbing deeply hidden hurts with a private medicine. Well, uh, I felt in my book about my mother, that was the Weight of the Angel book, that we needed to put in a disclaimer I did uh, that, that takes a step back, talks about the limits of, of language trying to capture another person, trying to capture experience. And uh, I put in kind of a corrective in that book. And the title of that corrective is Critical Monologue of a Daughter. So I'll read that one next. Critical Monologue of a Daughter. I've trapped her. Every move she makes trips a hidden spring and she goes down, a muffled scream, losing another inner flag of freedom, fully absorbed and swollen with the emphasis I ascribe to her. While she busies herself with service over turkey slices and place settings, but I determine her every motive, from the initial outpouring to the last dish washed and put away. I won't release her in these lines. All too easy to continue to invent, to reinterpret every look and mood according to my lights and darks. But what of her own voice and living acts? Are no breathing changes allowed? What right have I to decide to write about her? Who is transparent even to herself? Look, I must admit to being completely at a loss with her. She's not a character in a book. Well, the next couple, um, switch in time and um, I'd like to read one in, about my husband and myself when we were teenagers and it's sort of a double portrait uh, of opposites and uh, you'll see uh, an engineering mind meeting a budding poet mind at the drive-in and this is called heart-shaped cam Heart-shaped cam, your blue cave Ford tilts us into sky, hitched to a speaker pole, buzzed and tinny violins croon softly, our bodies settle side by side. I lean to that voice, explaining how a cam fastens onto an axle. Oh, the things that could flatter a girl, thrilled by no nonsense, as breezes brush our clasped hands. You tell me, a cam changes circular motion to reciprocating motion, back and forth, off-center, wobbly wheel motion, lifting until the whole heavy contrivance of youth moves. A cam? A circle with a blemish, a bump, creating a high point, a lift for the tappet to follow. Oh, I see it. The wheel projecting motion to another wheel. Eccentric, heart-shaped cam. Imagined as the rising moon's lopsided face sealed in our second date that you would listen 
that you would answer with respect all my questions was the first thing you ever explained to me. Forty years ago, yesterday, it's still the why of everything. I thought I'd use that poem to lead into a couple more about my parents, and particularly their marriage and their late, uh, late period of their marriage. And this is um, called After Windfalls. After Windfalls. They told me they'd been out to Apple Hill, these two who once picked bushels of apples to sustain us after wartime. Now he must have dawdled with the little wagon, she striding straight ahead, directing him where to pull it. Stretched tree arms bridged the silences between them as they searched long rows in the deep grass for the perfectly good apples machines had left behind. They spotted them, shining on the ground, stooped down, reached in to snatch up and toss each one with a muffled thump into the rumbling steel bed. The sun was sinking lower in our mellow Indian summer, almost too warm for their woolen sweaters, moving side to side under motionless, high swollen clouds. It was in that lull two days after the doctors had pronounced his arteries all clear, that he went with her yesterday, yes, after breakfast, to find apples for her pies. It must have seemed a gift of sudden riches, freshly hidden in Glassenberry's old orchards, retreating higher up now behind the huge houses, gleaning, just as if new married, the still plentiful pickings left to themselves. Um, I lost my father in 2003 and um, wa watched my mother come to grips with her new status. And uh, so I wrote this poem uh, that takes a look at her character through looking at her prized possession of violets, her African violet collection, which you'll see acts as kind of a barometer of her moods and especially the, the anger stages of grief you'll see later in the poem. It's called Violets. Violets, showing them off her pride to count the buds on their slim thread necks, drooping like the heads of shy children. She and Grandma shared cuttings, two become four, become eight, become 16 plants, enjoying constant lavished care. On the table by the pitcher window, thick fuzzed plants, unyankable even in decay, burgeoning velvet leaves with fresh blooms and full glory over spilling rims. Pot bound, they'd get moved to bigger pots. Always a tray of them somewhere. Back room, Ellington Street, Bissell Street, Belden, by her bay window in the trailer and later condo den. When grandma died, Mom adopted all her orphans, nurturing. When Dad sickened, failed, and wanted to try sleeping in the den, she moved all the violets to the hall. The last few crammed for months, jostled in the shadows, leaves succumbing to black mold, doused in absent-mindedness without joy. I enter the condo, five months since he died. Remorseless, she swept every table bare of violets, 
some thrown out in full bloom, like violence, heaped on violence, that has taken all she loves and expects her to go on. The violets, ah, plants, they're just a bother, always needing something. This poem is a portrait of my father. It's actually an elegy uh, I wrote after he passed away. And it starts with some uh, references to the songs that he loved to sing or whistle, uh, some of the um, 30s romantic ballads. He loved to work in his workshop. And he, for me, was something of an artist figure working alone and making the most of the materials that he had at hand, including things that he pulled out of the dumpster, uh, which he called the source. <laughs> and this one's called Lord of Broken Things. Lord of Broken Things. The girl of his dreams, has he met her yet? Grown accustomed to her face? Can he take her hand? Is there a source there, like his secret source, named for his condo's pre-dawn dumpster, heaped with broken blenders, cracked decked furniture, for him to save, fix? Has he a little shed, walls to call his own, or a cellar? Is he in heaven's cellar? With utility light and workbench, he'd need that for an endless stream of stringless harps to mend, save, and give away. Is memory a useful thing in heaven? String stories binding. Will he feel the heavy oranges pile up, overspilling his small arms beside the boxcar? The other boys vanished leaving him to face the wheezing guards bearing down? No, he'd buy none of this. What was real here, he'd be the first to admit has no shape there, that place where no fish eludes a line, where no girl but hangs upon the next dazzling line, where one no longer needs to struggle to salvage love from the destructions of time by hand or mind or magic or by his own stubbornly lonely whistled songs. Well, I have more. Um, I'll read just about three more then. Um, this is a short elegy for both my brother and father. It's called Opening. Walls, the familial walls. You knew how thick and how high they grew and where not to place your foot or probe too deep or hard or press your case or try another word, yet all dissolves. Father's thwarting allure, brother's mock fortress. Their word wiliness and shyness are gone with their blank mirrors, gone with the closed daughter of a male line of naysayers and stonewallers. And you have to create another self, and you have to go on without them. What form will you take in this fallen world without their flights of speech pushing you into dreaming? Stymied now, faltering, the will propels you even beyond this outlandish pitch of words learned from the men who will not hear them. Grief song. Long looking after you, father, brother, I was in the words you didn't sound. From an old book I take my grief song Rosemary, daisies, violets, rue, scattering your names on moving waters. Look for me in cloud water moon glimmer. 
submerged in the underskin of pages. Look for me. I live below. And this one is called Her Benica Rose, and it's for my mother. It's a short poem. Her Benica Rose. We are struggling to transfer a rose bush between our cars, mother and I. Before I lift, she stands deadheading old blooms. Couldn't recall if you have any roses out there where you are. Do you? I do. Roses on roses. But no matter. I have the delicate, old-fashioned pink of her rose now. I have the massy earthen weight of this root. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Marilyn. I think you've presented us with a, a series of perfect shots, <laughs> as they say at UConn, nothing but net. And like that uh, single spectator out on the fairway, uh, we applaud you, but uh, certainly not ironically. <laughs> and thank you for those lovely poems. And uh, I also want to thank uh, Ken Picard and Karen Handeville, who made this program possible. Uh, and to say that if you would like to learn more about Marilyn Johnston and read samples of her work, uh, please do visit the Antrim House website, uh, www.antrimhousebooks.com. And while you're there, you may be interested in other Antrim House poets whose lives and works are described on the website. Goodbye for now until we meet again next month for the 10th installment of Speaking of Poetry.